Hello and welcome on this gorgeous July the 2nd, 2024. I uh, thought here, uh, since I'm the preaching patriot here on the um, Bible Doctor channel, that uh, as we're approaching July 4th, our Independence Day, that uh, I'd go ahead and share with you um, just a brief uh, patriotic message, something a little bit about the founding of our country, and uh, tie that in with the gospel message. You know, you hear a lot about democracy here in the United States. We're making the world safe for democracy or making our home safe for democracy. And the interesting thing is that our nation was never founded on democratic principles. When you hear people say this, they, they may be saying it with well intentions. I, I'm not here to judge that. But it's an incorrect statement. It's not founded in our founding documents. It's not founded in the Mayflower Compact. It's not founded in our Constitution. Uh, it's certainly not founded in our um, Declaration of Independence uh, or in our Pledge of Allegiance uh, to our flag, which literally is not pledging to a piece of cloth, but really pledging allegiance to our nation, uh, showing honor to those who have fought and died to keep our nation free. And we have what's known as a representative republic in our nation. Uh, we are actually founded on republicanism. And even though for many years leadership referred to itself in democratic fashion, what it simply meant was that people had a large voice that is in government of, by, and for the people. You see, if you look carefully at our Constitution, you'll find out that term limits was something that was very important to the Founding Fathers. People were supposed to come in, serve a single or a dual term, and then they were supposed to return back home and live, and this is primarily for legislators, uh, that is lawmakers in the legislative branch, they were supposed to come back home and live under the laws that they had created. There was not supposed to be anything uh, akin to a, a career politician. That, that's something that was totally foreign to our founding fathers and, and to those who lived within the first century or so after our nation had been founded. Uh, that's really more of a modern construct, and we see where it's gotten us. It, it's created a lot of issues. So without throwing anything out that really sounds like my opinion, what I'd like to do is share a few things from our own historical documents and then share a couple things from Scripture as we approach uh, the 4th of July here in 2024. And by the way, before I do that, I, I'd like to wish you and yours a blessed safe, and continued free holiday here in the United States of America. Article 4, Section 4 of the United States Constitution identifies, and this is the article that speaks of statehood, this is the article speaking of states' rights, states' rights beyond what the Constitution says for the, the nation, and about the formation of states. And it says this, The United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a Republican form of government. Now, this is not in the sense that we say Republican versus Democrat as in the two great national parties of our, of our nation. This means a representative form. In other words, I get together with people who think the way I think about the way the government should be run, and I elect an official, and that official represents me and those like me in office. That person represents my thoughts. That person represents my ideas. That person represents my desires and my principles. If somebody gets in that doesn't represent those things in another four years or six years, depending on the position of office, I vote again. And that's the way things are supposed to work. 
right? And that person represents me. The presidential election works the same way. The presidential election, we don't vote for the president directly. We vote for electors who then, in turn, from the Electoral College, go and take our will to Washington, D.C., and then vote for the president. Some people have a real problem with that, but the bottom line, it has worked for generations. Every once in a while they say, well, the popular opinion uh, should sway. But when you end up with popular opinion, sometimes what you end up with is mob rule. Sometimes what you end up with is a situation where people do this thing called gerrymandering, where they try to make one district heavy, heavy Democrat or one district heavy Republican or one district heavy independent so it can be swayed one way or the other. We don't want that. We want those representatives to be our, to be our bulwark, to be, to be steadfast so that we can go to them and that they will represent us in the Electoral College for the presidential election. So it's, it's a stopgap to prevent mob rule, basically, is what happens in an election. So that's what we're looking for. Our Pledge of Allegiance, in fact, says, and to the republic for which it stands, and that is our flag. Our flag stands for a republic, a representative government, okay? Not a mob rule government, not a, <clears throat> excuse me, not a government where the, the, the populace basically says, look, if we don't get our way, we're going to riot, we're going to fight, we're going to... We're going to cause all this unrest. No, we select people who represent us, and that's what a republic is. And then they will represent us. If they don't do a good job, we'll have to put up with them for a time, but then we can change that. And if we were to stick to our original intent, which was a limited-term government, then those people making those laws within a brief amount of time would have to come back and live under those laws. Right now, that doesn't exist a whole lot, at least not in Washington, D.C. That would make that would be a really terrific change if that could be brought about. Article 1, Section 2, which speaks of the legislative branch, the lawmaking branch of government, says specifically the House of Representatives, and it's speaking of Congress in general in Article 1, Section 2, Section 2 speaks specifically of the House of Representatives within the entire body of Congress, which is the House of Representatives and the Senate, Congress in total. The House of Representatives is the most numerous branch of the state legislature. That is, those people who are elected to represent individuals from their states by district, by individual district. That is the most numerous of the two bodies in Congress. And the reason why that is is because we want our voice heard in Washington, D.C. And we can't have our voice heard if it's the same people saying the same thing all the time. Now, I'm not going to get into the, into the finer points of politics and all this lobbying stuff and everything else. I'll, I'll let other people do that. All right. I want to point out a more biblical point on this. Our salvation in Christ Jesus is not of ourselves. It's representative. It equates to our legislature here in the United States. In fact, I should turn it the other way around. Our legislature, our lawmaking, that's what legislature is, our lawmaking here in the United States reflects the work and will of Christ. Watch this. In John, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, we read, we have an advocate. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. The Lord Jesus is our advocate. He's the one that when we sin, if we're saved and we're in Christ, when we sin, we come before the Lord. We we confess our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and forgive us of all unrighteousness. That's a plural word, by the way, in the, in the original Greek. Forgive us of all unrighteousness says. All of them. And it's the same 
He is our advocate. He is our representative. We don't go before the Father. We, we speak to the Father in Jesus' name, but Jesus is the one who covers our sin. It's his shed blood that covers our sin. If we don't know Jesus and we come for him for the first time for salvation, and we throw, we throw ourselves at the feet of the cross and cry out for his mercy, it is he who becomes our advocate at that moment. Nothing we can do to save ourselves. We're told in Scripture by no deeds of the law, no works, no deeds of the law, are men justified. Now, it's good to live according to the way that the Lord teaches us, and the Ten Commandments are, a, are, are not only wonderful, but necessary direction to take once you've been saved, because that reflects the Christ that's in you. But they're not going to save you. They will show that you are saved, because you live to please God and to serve the Lord and to serve your fellow man. But Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 really wraps up the entire principle, and that is it. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There's, there's no boasting. There's nothing where we can say, Lord, I'm so good that I deserve to be in heaven. There's no man that can say that. There's no woman that can say that. There's no person on earth that can say that. None of us is that good. We are born in sin. We are conceived in sin. David says this. King David writes this. We are conceived in sin. So we're, we're, we're done from the beginning. We need to cry out to the Lord Jesus. We need to call out to him. We need to ask him. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life in John 14:6. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But once you do, the floodgates are open. The blessings are eternal. And you have that advocate who never rests, never sleeps, and is always there for you. Until next time, stay in his word and stay true to his word. In Christ's undying love, amen.